I'll be here. Okay, no, he's at Elkhart. Oh, Elkhart. Elkhart. I'll be here. So, weren't you supposed to be at Elkhart? I left early so I could be here. What? It, we playing hooky? Uh, All double, right, we are live. Double close the chair. Um, I see him right there. Good morning. Today is Thursday, March 31st, 2022. It is 9.03 a.m. And this is a meeting in Senate Natural Resources and Energy. We're picking up our work uh, again on H715 and act relating to the clean heat standard. And our first guest today is um, Mr. Coda, Matt Coda. So please join us at the table. <laughs> good, looking good. All right. So good to see you. Thanks for joining us this morning. Is that pink spot on? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I'm the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee. My name is Matt Coda. I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont Fuel Dealers Association. Um, I'm reminded by my wife, who's an elementary school teacher, that when I took the masks off, the noise in the room became so loud because people have been used to talking with masks. If I sound like I'm shouting, I assure you I'm smiling. I just want to enunciate clearly for the camera and for your all of you. Um, so the Vermont Field Dealers Association is a position I've held during that organization for the past 15 years. Um, what we do is we train mostly. Most of my job is to run a school that trains heating technicians and delivery drivers. So if they're in your basement or they're outside your house with a truck, they went to our school, they were trained by us. Um, I'd like to start, if I may, with an aphorism, often recycled by lobbyists, by General George S. Patton, and by self-help novelists, <coughs> originally by French philosopher Francois-Marie Voltaire, which says, do not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Well, we know that H715 CHS is not perfect. We know this because the advocates told us so. Um, what we need to figure out is if it's any darn good. So I'm gonna give you my opinion, but in the embracing the edict of Senator Bray, I'd like to start on an optimistic note and let you tell you what the CHS gets right. So for many, many years, I've been coming here, sitting in this chair and other committee rooms, trying to tell you that you can't do it without us. That the enemy is not the people that are delivering heating fuel and installing heating systems, that we are in fact integral to the effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And the CHS acknowledges that. It also recognizes that the all electric thermal energy policy is not realistic. There is this notion that a Mitsubishi heat pump, mini split, ductless mini split that goes in your wall is somehow replacing your central heating system. That is not true. It's an excellent advertising campaign, but it is simply not true. The compressors go on concrete outside and the mini splits go on the walls. How do we know this? Because we install them. We install most of them, the heating service community. The reality is that most Vermonters cannot live in this cold rural state without combustion. But don't take my word for it. After all, I'm biased. We, we train the people that install combustion equipment. Just take the testimony from yesterday, quote, given our building stock, our climate, and the state of current technology, meeting our heating needs with electrification is, quote, simply not possible. CHS recognizes this, bravo. It's currently written, provides an economic opportunity to sellers of biofuel, biogas, and biomass, and the home energy contractors to install and repair heating service equipment. These are my people, plumbers, heat techs, delivery drivers, more than 10,000 licensed and certified individuals that go through our school, including nearly 900 oil heat technicians, nearly 2,000 licensed plumbers, nearly 3,000 gas techs, nearly 1,200 CDL holders, the people with a license issued by the state of Vermont that allows them to drive a truck. What you have in H715, the CHS, be generous, is an outline of a very important, worthy concept. It's an outline. Senator McDonald, you asked a simple question yesterday that deserves an answer. Let me give you mine. Let me be blunt. 
Who are the winners and losers here? Well, look to the north and look to the east. GMP, Energier, Noverco, Hydro-Quebec, Mitsubishi Corporation. Anyone that sells an electron, produces an electron, counts an electron, distributes an electron, or sells a device that needs electrons. They're winning. Big time. Who are the losers? You don't have to look that far. Just find your local fuel dealer. Anyone that continues to sell heating oil, propane, kerosene to the state of Vermont will have to pay a higher price and so will their consumers. Call it a tax, call it a fee, call it a fine, call it a penalty. Honestly, genuinely, I don't care. It's a semantic argument for two purposes, a political argument, number one, number two, a legal argument, because we all know that the Constitution does requires the legislature to issue a tax, not the PNC. So those will be decided by lawyers, and I'm not one of them. I should have gone to law school, but I didn't. So rather than wait into legal semantics, let's just call say that H17 authorizes the PUC to issue a financial consequence to those that continue to distribute this essential commodity, heating oil, kerosene, propane, that would be paid for the people that continue to use this commodity. So how do we make this bill better? How do you get the good? There are lots of ideas. In the interest of time, I'll, I'll just give you six. I'll flag six. First, the default delivery agent. This is the concept as expressed by uh, Richard Coward, of which if we don't do enough things that government wants us to do, like sell biofuel, install heat pumps, do weatherization services, install more efficient equipment. If we don't do enough of those things to counteract all of our sales of heating oil, propane and kerosene, then we've got to purchase credits from the default delivery agent. We'll then take that money and do the things that we didn't do. Right? That's the concept. The default delivery agent cannot be a market participant. First of all, how do you become the default delivery agent? It's unclear. Do you bid on it? If you do, where does the money go? Do you get paid to be the default delivery agent? If so, who does the pay? If a company has to bid $1 to become the default delivery agent and that for-profit company sells widgets, I'll bet you money. They're going to sell more widgets. It cannot be a for profit electric company or other entity. It should be the Office of Economic Opportunity or a similarly aligned nonprofit that is, that is technology neutral. That's the whole point of the CHS technology neutral. Where does the Office of Economic Opportunity go? They go into low income homes and they ensure that that home is safe, warm, and comfortable and reduces their energy burden. That's what the Office of Economic Opportunity does. They can't do it, assign it to a nonprofit like a capstone or efficiency Vermont that does it. Do not let a for-profit company enter this space. It's dangerous. Senator McDonald, you also asked, can you sell the same horse twice? Yes, of course you can, if you're an electric company. What did we do in 2015? This body said, we're gonna reverse our previous policy on energy. And instead of incentivizing people to install a propane water heater, we are gonna lose those incentives and we're gonna encourage them to use more electricity. The old idea, less poles and wires, no more nuclear power plants, no more coal plants, reversed when we decided we should have more renewable electricity and that we should use more of that renewable electricity rather than fossil fuels. That's the policy, 2015, Governor Shumlin. So as a result, we created this obligation and this permission structure for the electric utilities to sell more electrons. So if I sell, if I'm an electric company, mass electricity, and I sell or I incent a Mitsubishi heat pump, a couple things happen. One, I can build that in my capital expense of which I get a guaranteed rate of return thanks to the PUC. I sell more electrons, ching ching. I get credit for tier three, and I no longer have to make a financial alternative compliance payment because I'm reducing carbon emissions in my customer's home. And now I can take that sale, go to my local fuel company and say, hey, you didn't sell enough heat pumps or do enough weatherization or sell enough biofuel or sell enough pellets. You wanna buy this ticket? Sold it four times. That horse is well-traveled. 
Second problem, low income credits. I understand the, the meaning of this, I understand why we wanna do it. We wanna make sure that policies that will undoubtedly increase the cost of fossil fuels used for heat, in fact, don't harm, they'll become a regressive tax fee, compliance payment, whatever you wanna call it. That those that can least afford increases in the cost of energy are least burdened by these policies. That's why we have a credit system designed with this two tier structure. But I'm still grappling with it. It requires us, fuel providers, to provide invasive and perhaps illegal income verification checks of our customers. You want a gallon of heating oil? Show me your W 2. Now I've been told, oh, no, no, Matt, it's not going to be that rigorous. It's not going to be that rigorous. Just a self attestation. That is ripe with fraud on both sides. A self attestation in order to get cheap credits. That shouldn't happen. What other government policy, I ask you, in which a business suffers financial penalties for their customers' annual income? There's got to be a better way that we can do this. I understand why we're doing it. I just don't understand practically how we are going to ensure a third of our credits that we generate or acquire, in fact, come from people with less than 80% their median income or whatever the, whatever the, the clip is. It's, it's a mystery. Three, greet is good. Not greet, not greet, not greet. T, G-R-E-E-T is good. And this is important because you're being messaged by those that are telling you greed is not good. Greet. Sorry, it's hard to not see it with a mask. I, I still didn't get that. Greet is a policy developed by the US Department of Energy, Argonne National Laboratories, and the acronym is Greenhouse Gases, Regulated Emissions, Energy Use, and Transportation. This is how California, with all their resources, relies on to run their low carbon fuel standards. There are those, and I know you're getting a message that says, no, 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 no. We need our own boutique version of carbon emission calculations. We need to be able to finesse it in the tag process to make sure that we are in control of calculating emissions. This is the first time any, if this passes, that heating oil and propane, greenhouse gas emissions will be regulated by a public utility commission. Not California, not Oregon, not Colorado. Colorado's natural gas, pipe gas. California and Oregon are transportation fuels. This is the very first time we are breaking ground here. And it is largely because it is a Northeast product. 90% of the oil heat sold in the United States the nine Northeastern states, right? So if you're creating something that the advocates want to replicate in other states, that we want to hold up and say, look what we did in Vermont, copy us, it has to be the national standard. Greet for the T is good. Do not change that. Or fix the tag. The technical advisory group, right now it calls for one, one, individual from the obligated entities. There's gonna be over a hundred obligated entities. There's five fuels that are going to be obligated. One of them is already regulated by the PUC. The other four, coal, kerosene, oil, heat, and propane. PUC has no idea what they're doing. We need to make sure, and the companies that distribute this, from a guy with a truck and a broken down F-150, F-350, to the largest and largest companies in the country. We need more than one person on the tag because all of the shenanigans happen in the tag. The tag is where we determine what service and what fuel is worth what amount of credit. And if I'm in the business of selling electrons, I'm flooding the zone. There's gonna be so many lawyers in the tag that put the highest value on electron and the lowest value on wood and all the other products. Geothermal is going to come in there, but I know the score. It will be the lawyers from the back that win the day. I've been around too long to tell you anything different. I'm, I'm, you're speaking really quickly and I'm having trouble following the, the words. That's probably my hearing problem. I apologize. Really interesting what you're saying. So. Oh, I appreciate that. Um, 
So the technical advisory group, which will determine the value of a credit or determine what service or fuel gets what value, is the whole ballgame. This, all, this is all meaningless for us, the purveyors of, of lower carbon fuel, if we don't have equal representation in the tag. And given that, there are five different fuels and 100 different obligated parties, one would think we deserve more seats at the table. Or otherwise, the fix for the tag, the fix will be in. And we can see that a mile away. Number five. Which you would say is what? What will the fix be? Add more of us to the tag. The obligated parties deserve to be able to fight on equal measures. I'm sorry, if you're, if you're not at the table, what do you think? No, oh, clearly, the, the, the ones with the most resources and advocacy in the tag will get the product that they sell higher credit value, the product that others that are not part of the table, the lowest credit value. What does that matter? Higher credits will be worth more, lower credits will be worth less. So if I was a weatherization, if I, was a, if I sold insulation, if I was burning, I sold insulation, yeah. I'd want to flood the tag and say insulation the cellulose is the most important thing you can do and should receive the highest amount of credits. God bless it. That's capitalism. Good for them. Biomass, natural gas, renewable natural gas, biodiesel, uh, Mitsubishi Corporation, Hydro Quebec, they'll all, they'll all flood the tag with people. I've been part of this process, the 2015 Energy Act. Let me tell you. It's going to be an ordeal, and I'm ready for it, but I need some help. Number five, this is the second most important thing, saving the best for the last. Enforcement. Bring the PUC in here. They came and testified for the House Energy Committee, the Director of Policy. They were asked five simple questions. Who sells fuel in Vermont? How much do they sell? Where does it come from? Do you have the power to enforce these regulations on these fuel companies? I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. We need to know because if they don't know, the people who are obligated will not care if they know that they aren't going to be pulled, pulled into the tax department and regulated and paid and have to pay the bill. The PUC does not have enforcement capability, has enforcement capability on companies which it designates a monopoly, designated market share, and a guaranteed rate of return. When an electric company sells to another electric company, they have to have a hearing for the Public Utility Commission. They have to determine whether this is the best interest of consumers. They have to approve the sale. Heating fuel businesses go out of business every year. They sell their company or they close their doors. I know because I've seen them go. My 15 years of doing this. If we do not enforce the CHS, the loopholes and the spill laws will be so big we'll be able to drive an oil truck through it. We need to make sure that the honest taxpayers, the Vermonters that pay their bills, comply with the law, are not gutted by those that can work in this universe with lax enforcement. And the only one that can really enforce it are the people with guns, badges, and trucks. The Department of Motor Vehicles, Department of Transportation are the only ones that can pull over a truck on the side of the road and say, stop. Are you carrying a bill of lading? Are you describing the contents of your equipment? Are you certified to drive an oil truck? Do you have, have you registered with the PUC? If that doesn't happen, honest fuel dealers will lose out because of lax enforcement. At two cents a gallon, no, juice isn't worth the squeeze. At 25 cents a gallon, this whole system of distributing this essential commodity that keeps people warm, provides hot water and cooking gas will be chaos. This needs to be fixed. Number six. Most important thing you can do in the next two weeks as you consider rearranging how we distribute 100 million gallons of heating oil and 100 million gallons of propane, providing heat, hot water, and cooking gas for four every five homes in Vermont. As you think about this over the next week, consider this. What if this 
good concept, great idea. What if the PUC can't do it? What if they fail? What if they design something that is so clear to me now, but will be clear to others later, is only going to introduce chaos into this marketplace? Wouldn't you want to be able to hit the e brake, hit pause? I know I would. Add a check back amendment. Proposed in the House, it failed. Proposed by the administration. There's many different versions. I have my own flavor. A check back amendment, necessary and appropriate as you redesign the energy landscape. Um, thank you for your time. I swear I'm not shouting. Just trying to enunciate it. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you. Um, any trade questions? One simple one. The twenty-five cent a gallon figure. Where does that? Oh, that, that that's made up. We have no idea. We have no idea how much this will cost. We don't know what the starting credit price will, and we don't know where the credit price will be five years out. That is all going to be determined. I'm just saying, at two cents a gallon, when you call the tax department and say, "Go collect the fuel tax from this company," it's a small company. They're not going to care. There are so many loopholes in the clean heat standard when you try to figure out how to enforce this on companies that honestly, they don't even know it exists. I can tell you with alarming clarity how a gallon of heating oil from Levis, Quebec gets to your tank, depending on where you live and who you bought it from. I can trace that gallon like no one else in the state. I still don't have, and I'm, maybe I'm not that smart, but I have no idea when I trace that gallon where it comes from, where it goes, how it gets there, who the obligated party is. And guess what? The PUC doesn't even know where that gallon comes from. This is a potential to be a chaos agent into how we distribute heating fuel. Like, it also has the opportunity to transform their energy landscape. I will give it credit for that. If we can sell more biodiesel and more biomass, we can get paid for doing energy efficiency services. This is what we all want. But removing combustion from the bill, as some advocates have demanded, kicking the fuel dealers to the side and the heating service contractors in favor of those that are designing policies in air conditioned offices, that's not going to work either. No? So you say it's like, you know, all on milk. And we can't even get, we can't get chips and, and wood products that. Tell us what's in the truck. There's some records. Um, Senator McCormick. Yeah, thanks. Um, this often happens here that the, the witness is an expert. That's why you get to be a witness. And none of us are experts. We maybe know something. But, uh, so to a certain extent, it's in the nature that you, you have to be talking down to the committee. I don't mean your demeanor. I mean the, the actual nature of the testimony. Uh, and I've got to confess that I am dis dismayingly confused about okay. the details here, sure. with which you are very familiar. But on the other hand, uh, the novice is more likely to step back and ask the big question. Okay. And I'm hearing from environmental groups who are complaining about this bill that it's the fox guarding the hen house. If you're not the fox, I don't know who is. I do want to mention that I I uh, introduced the bill banning the witness label track. I have a soft spot for fox. Okay, so <laughs> and you and you have your job to do. But would you just explain to me the role of people who are purveyors of fossil fuels, sellers of fossil fuels, how you work in a benign way. If the goal is to get off of fossil fuels, how, how that works. So so just to, to be clear, I'm, I'm not Neil Wonderwell. I don't control a utility. I have a disparate members of groups of all shapes and sizes and all political opinions. There are some, that see a tremendous opportunity with the clean heat standard. It's a minority, but there are some who see an opportunity to increase market share, profitability by doing what the government wants them to do, sell less fossil fuel, 
and more energy services, more biomass, more biodiesel. There's a way, path forward. But for others, there is simply not. And so I can't convince every fuel company to follow the path that these 10 companies are following. I can encourage them, I can show them way, I can show them the possibilities, but I can neither enforce the law amongst my membership, it's a nonprofit trade association. You join or you don't. I can show the pathway if this passes to succeeding, but I'm I don't have a steering wheel. Whether or not a company that sells fossil fuels in Vermont sees a pathway is what they're going to make at their kitchen table or their board table. And they'll either choose to participate that way or they will not. You do not have to stay in business. You are not compelled to stay in business here. You can leave. And if they don't like the rules, and this happens plenty of times, it happens in New York with Vermont companies. Vermont, some Vermont companies don't travel across the border in Denington because of the rules that New York has set up for businesses that distribute heating fuel. That's their choice. They didn't want to put, they don't want to do that game, they don't do it. Same could happen here. Or perversely, the worst in which the companies that know they can get away with not paying any credits at all, <laughs> control the market and take it away from the honest taxpayers who live in our market. That's not fair. A model that I look to for some hope is, uh, remember how shocking it was to look at the list of the possessions of Liggett and Meyer, tobacco company, mm. and all sorts of stuff that's not tobacco. Right. Okay. And and I remember thinking they've read the hand, the writing on the wall and they're diversified. Right. They're a capitalist corporation. Their job isn't tobacco, their job is make money. And, you get, and so you take your capital and you put it someplace else. So then it's uh it, is it possible that, that over time those distributors of, of fuel oil will become distributors of um, of greener technology? Yeah. Solar panels. That's that's the idea behind biodiesel. Yeah. That's the idea is that if we can create a sustainably sourced product that can be blended seamlessly and eventually replace fossil-based distillate that can scientifically prove to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and comply with the Global Warming Solutions Act. That's what New York is doing. That's what Connecticut's doing. That's what Massachusetts is doing. That's what Rhode Island's doing. So California is doing the transportation fuel. Could you fill biodiesel in your tank, not pay any more as a commodity cost, not pay any more for new equipment costs? Could the same company deliver it? Yeah. And that's the promise of CHT. The fear is that it is this architecture crumbles and the companies that are interested in pursuing that path. Don't make it. That's my fear. It may not be other spheres, but that's my fear. Senator Weston? So, of the people you represent, how many of them have on their service side, you allude to it in it, um, have moved into putting in heat pumps, doing all the service type work um, for that? How much of the business? is that now and how many companies have moved into that do you know so yes so i can tell you that any company that does heating service remember you have to have an s electrician's license to connect break into the baker box connect your boiler your burner your furnace or your heat pump and all of those companies about half of them do some sort of service there's thirty thousand heat pumps that installed why do we do it Customers want them. Why do they want them? We did a survey. We know why. Air conditioning. 60% of the homes in Vermont are boiler heated with radiators. They don't have central air because they don't have central ducting. They're not furnaces. They're older homes that are, some of them not very well weatherized, and they are hot. And we all become accustomed to comfort. Even the cheapest Hyundai has air conditioning in it now. Mm -hmm. And what do they want? They want air conditioning. It's been those companies that sell heat pumps have done okay. They do not replace central heating system. Underline, underscore, flashing red lights. They are space heaters and coolers. 
Central heating system is that thing in your basement that generates fire, combustion, whether it be wood, kerosene, biodiesel, propane, natural gas, coal. What we're trying to do as an industry is be a multi-service company that does all of the things that customers want, including air conditioning, and figure out a way to get them to use less and to use a lower carbon fuel. Didn't say that we wouldn't sell them zero, but if you want to, we, we, we've sold fewer gallons. I mean, oil heat is consistently my lost market share. 40 years ago, oil heat had 90% market share in Vermont. Now we're at 43, 44%. And our gallons per home have gone down as we get more efficient homes, more efficient equipment, better fuel. That will continue as we install both by the heat pumps. 750 gallons we sell per home on average in Vermont of heating oil, we'll get to 400 over the next five years. Doesn't mean we don't need that fuel or those companies. Doesn't mean they're not gonna remain profitable. It means you gotta figure out how to do more with less. So join the crowd. So do we know of the heat pumps that were installed last year? Um, how many were installed by the service departments from your fuel companies versus non-fuel companies? I, so if we were in the state of New York, I could tell you exactly what address and zip code those heat pumps, those incentivized heat pumps were, because they have a different way of accounting for their program. In Vermont, we do it differently. There's value the way we do it, but I'm not besmirching my friends at Efficiency Vermont, also a member of the Vermont Dealer Association. The way we do it is called an upstream rebate. So we go to the supply warehouses and they buy down the cost of the thermal cold climate heat pumps. So as people don't install the cheaper, but non cold climate heat pumps that just provide air. It makes sense. You get more bang for your buck. You go right to the source of sale, the, the, the wholesale suppliers, the FWS, the Granite Roots, the, the Pelagets. And you say, okay, we want you to push these. We're gonna help lower your cost. You have to guarantee the low cost. It all works out fine, except for, we can't track who installs them because the rebate is what they say upstream. If it were downstream, like it is in New York, well, I could print out the spreadsheet and show you exactly what zip code and what provider provided it. I could also tell you whether they installed one in their living room or they installed multiples. But actually, you could, by the number of mini splits, you can tell how much of that heat load is going to absorb and therefore how many gallons of, of fossil you're going to reduce. So there's we no don't have that. There's nobody that can estimate it for us now. Oh, um, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the question a uh, slightly different way. Sure. So I put heat pumps in um, the family farmhouses. Um, we, um, and I would have gone to the fuel company that does it, but um, the guy that was the manager for the fuel company until two years ago, and he set out on his own, his own um, um, plumbing, heating, right. um, he did it. Right. But he got all his training through the, so it's all this. So I'm just trying to figure out how much of that work you guys are already doing in what Because well, I don't know. Well, half the companies have service. Whether or not they sell one heat pump or yeah, or, or I some, it. I don't know. But but back to Senator McCord's point, which is, what about the companies that don't do any of this work? I don't know. They might go away. They might just pay the fee and continue to do what they do, or not. It's just, this is this is a red. This is an important policy. I want to import how consequential this is. When you hear this is not a tax, yeah, it's not a tax. Tax is simple. It's not a ban. Yeah, a ban is simple. It's not a mandate. A mandate is simple. This is something else entirely. This is radically reorganizing how the distribution of heating fuels is regulated, creating a new regulator in the mix, one that currently lacks any enforcement capabilities. One that currently lacks any understanding of how many gallons we sell, who sells them, where they're purchased, where they're sold to, and how they even enforce it on. A company that can travel in the middle of the night across the border, deliver 100 gallons, travel back. This is, this is serious. And I know it's serious. And I know you know it's serious. I know the Climate Council spent all of many hours talking about how, showing modeling of how this can reduce fossil fuel consumption. 
And I have no doubt that it will. Um, so but I'm not sure if the juices work this way. There's an extensive engagement process. There's the tag, there's a rule, I mean, there's rule making or dockets that are open. So they have notice and comment. Do you, so all these questions you're raising, do you not have confidence that the process as outlined will provide a mechanism to answer those questions before the program becomes live because that's three years out. That's accurate. Without a check back amendment, which has been proposed and disposed, but has been proposed again, without a check back amendment, I cannot tell my members, some who are on the path of doing exactly what the government wants to do and others who are not, I have no confidence to be able to tell them we'll get it right. We'll get it right in the regulatory process. Process which the utilities are very familiar with and staffed up. Process of which we are newcomers. So, so Mr. Chair, the check back amendment is what I guess they're asking. Is that essentially what we we required in statute when the public service board was going to make recommendations on how to change um, net metering. Right. We want to come back and check back with this committee before the, the rules went into effect. And, and that didn't happen, as you well know. Right. It was it's not. We, they, our we, actual mileage varied. Compared well, to they just yeah. went ahead and changed them and then. But we called them to account. The, uh, the PUC said, uh, "Well, if you stop us, we we made a mistake. We'll never do it again. And uh, and if you make us go back to the old way, all the utilities are going to have to reprogram your computers, and it's too damn expensive." And our colleagues in the here in the Senate said, "Oh my goodness, you're, you're putting them through the, the ringer. Don't do that." So um, I want to keep an eye on the clock and keep us moving on. If there's anyone have a last question for Mr. Bodo, I know you'll be also for your six suggestions to the degree that they involve any suggested new language. Have you gone that far as to say, well, here's what you might insert in the bill here, there, whatever? Well, uh, some, but not all. Okay. Um, the the, um, I don't know how to solve the, the two-tiered system for low-income credits. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, for any of the ones that you do, if you could send them out to the committee, that would be helpful. So we will switch from sort of higher-level testimony to you know, editing the uh, bill itself. Okay. Um, down. So, um, witness said that um, this isn't the, the PUC doesn't have any practice in this. It's a new Bailey way to fraught with uh, challenges. Um, we have piggybacked California cars. Um, it certainly has some faults, but things are pretty clear. You can sell a car in California, you can sell it here. And there's there's not a lot of our confusion. Is, are you suggesting that we, wishing we had a California to piggyback on this or? Uh, well, that, that's a, that's a, Good question because it was brought up in earlier testimony, which is if not this, then what? Like we're, we know this isn't perfect. I can see the loopholes. We can drive several little trucks through. Um, will we get those fixed in the next two years? The regulatory proceeding with a body that has no familiarity with our industry at all? Open pride. But uh, what's the alternative, right? And that's what you're hearing from the advocates. We thought about this for six months. We have no, we don't have anything else. What's the alternative? Well, the alternative is we don't do it. State of Vermont gets sued, and the Secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources is forced to promulgate regulations which will reduce fossil fuel consumption. So one of the regulations that they can do because they control air pollution emissions, point source emissions, as you heard from Ed McNamara, so is to ban the installation of oil and gas equipment used for cooking, heating, and hot water in new home construction. They could follow the car path as. Senator McDonald reference and say in 2035, no more new cars with combustion engines, no more new boilers or furnaces that use oil or gas. They can do that. A&R could do that. 
we'd still need to be here. And for many of my crowd, plus 50, that would be a welcome alternative than having to play in the credit market with the lawyers from any year. All right. Well, thank you very much for your testimony. Yeah, just did I hear the last thing you said right? Yes. You would prefer just no, not me. There's some plus 55. I'm still 48 years old. She said plus 55, not plus 50. Oh, no shit. Uh, I meant 55. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Good yeah. catch. <laughs> but the idea is that just straight regulation would be preferable to the look, credits. Look, there is some that have expressed that sentiment. I'm hopeful that the CHS can be sorted out. I, that's a lot of hoping, though. CHS, C, the clean heat standard. <laughs> Because yes, the clean okay. heat standard yes, okay. at its core recognizes yes. that the, the people that the, the B and T crowd, the boots and trucks crowd, not the electric company, not efficiency Vermont, they don't send people to your house to fix your equipment. We're the ones that do that. And the CHS, the clean heat standards, recognizes that, oh yeah, we need you to do that. Fantastic. Now let's make sure that it does it in an orderly way in which all people who deliver these services are treated fairly and equitably. There's a lot for the PUC to absorb. A little bit like, oh, I started with an F, with a uh, aphorism and I'll end with an allegory. It's like the blind man in the elephant here. They know they've got something here, but I don't think they know exactly what it is. I do. I can't figure it out. Actually, a good news. Okay. Thank you very Thanks much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next guest is uh, Leslie Anderson. Good morning, Ms. Anderson. Thanks for joining us. If you could introduce yourself to the committee and um, share your thoughts on Bill H715. Good morning. Thank you so much for letting me uh, zoom into the call. I, I head up the Propane Gas Association of New England. We are a regional um, association and I cover six states and I live in Maine and that's where I am this morning. So thank you for letting me talk to you via Zoom. I, I appreciate it. Can you hear me loud enough? Yes, thanks. All right. Um, I, I wanna echo um, one of the things that Matt just talked with you about and that is to, to um, include a check back program into this uh, bill so that it is reviewed before it is implemented, because there are so many unknowns that are out there. I think we really need to make sure that this is not not going to impact um, environmental justice communities and poor people within our state um, in a disproportionate manner than is it, it is intended. The um, The thing that I would like to do is tell you a little bit about the propane industry. Um, I myself am an environmentalist. I worked for two years for the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. Um, I have a master's in environmental management. I'm an environmental attorney, um, which um, I went to the Vermont Law School actually to specialize in the environmental classes that they have there. So um, I consider myself very much an environmentalist, which you may think is ironic having worked for uh, a propane association. but. The reason that I do is because I really believe that propane is the cleanest energy that is out there that is a combustion fuel. Propane itself is a byproduct of natural gas and there is more propane produced worldwide than is used. Um, and that has always been the case. There's propane that is flared off because it's not um, convenient to a transportation source or it doesn't have a market that's currently available and it's a wasted resource. So when we use propane, you know, it's, it's like recycling, it's like reuse. When you're using it, you're capturing something that's gonna exist whether you want it or not. And you can use that energy source to offset another energy source. The, um, the, the state of Vermont, as we rely more and more on electricity, I think propane is the perfect partner in terms of energy security, affordability, and also um, as a backup source for electricity that's out there. 
it's really incredulous to me to see Vermont not embracing propane as part of the strategy to reduce carbon emissions, especially where you're going to be so reliant on um, electricity and we need that backup power. And propane is a non-toxic backup power. It doesn't have toxic batteries in it. Um, and as I mentioned, it's the cleanest of all combustion fuels that's out there. One thing that I don't think was uh, thought about when this was put together is that there are many, many uses of propane besides heating that's out there. It's also transportation fuel, very little in Vermont, but it is used for so many different things. Um, Today, for instance, it's being used to feed the refugees that are fleeing from the Ukraine. All of, um, and it's always used also whenever there's any kind of an emergency or a natural disaster. And as the climate change is showing us, these weather events are more and more frequent. Propane itself is hydrogen rich. It's made up of three carbon and eight hydrogen atoms. There's not anything toxic in it. There's no methane like natural gas, which is a very bad uh, greenhouse gas. So for rural Vermonters and citizens that live in older homes, it's an affordable, reliable energy source and it promotes environmental justice, not just in Vermont, but around the world. Propane itself is the unsung hero of natural disasters and emergencies. Uh, for families with health concerns or elderly or small children, it's critical part of our infrastructure today for backup power in residential homes, in hospitals, at all of our cell towers. The reason you have communication when the electricity is out because propane keeps those cell towers running when the power is out. Our tourists that go through the state uh, utilize propane for camping, for hiking, uh, hot air balloons use propane. It's a portable energy source. And if you live off the grid, it's the preferred partner with solar for net zero uh, building. Tiny homes use it. Um, it's, it's also um, used for hot water, for cooking, lots of cooking um, uses for propane. And it's the complement with solar to get to that near net zero housing that I mentioned. Uh, so I, I really think we need to consider what is going to be our backup in Vermont besides electricity, and we should look to something that's non-toxic in that, in that part. I want to speak also to the point that Matt made about having representatives of the affected industries as part of the development process. Propane was not included. We had no propane industry representative as part of the Vermont Climate Council, and that resulted in the Climate Action Plan finding incorrect premises and making flawed recommendations within its plan. For example, the plan does not even mention renewable propane, um, and renewable propane is being used in California. California is incentivized the building of plants where dairy waste is put into an anaerobic digester. And it um, also produces DME, which can be added to renewable propane that's produced. Renewable propane is also a byproduct of biodiesel and biofuels. Uh, so there right now is technology and innovation taking place within our industry that produces a negative carbon intensity for renewable propane. And we've got a lot of innovation happening, yet it's not going to be able to happen in Vermont if we don't think about ways that we can include more renewable fuels and have a bigger playing field. Renewable propane can also be used as a backup. And the market is starting to explode around the world and here in the US for our producers looking at this line of uh, new clean fuel. So that's not even mentioned in the plan at all. Um, another example is the fact that the way that the clean heat standard um, is written now, it's taking recommendations from the Vermont Climate Action Plan that were supposed to be applied at the wholesale level. The idea was that when a propane uh, rail car or truck comes into the state, the wholesaler would apply this credit and be responsible for the credit system. 
that doesn't work. We have people that deliver into Vermont, but more often we have members in Vermont that go over state lines to get their supply of propane and bring it in. We have many members that deliver in Vermont and New Hampshire in, and New York. And keeping track of where these things are under the clean heat um, standard is gonna fall on the local businesses. My members are local family businesses primarily. I have a couple of um, larger companies that, that are in other states as well. But this is the local community, local small businesses that I represent primarily. That's the majority of my members. And this is gonna fall on them to figure out how to get these credits, how to um, apply for them, how to collect the number of uh, deliveries that they've had and calculate their gallons. It's gonna be a big administrative burden for a, for a small business that has maybe two or three people working in their office to add this to the additional obligations they have will end up requiring more staff, more time, and that's gonna be an administrative expense that will have to be passed along to their local customers, which will increase costs. Um, these burdens also will decrease competition. I think that small businesses will sell a lot of them. We have um, an older group of members and I would not be surprised if they just throw up their hands and it ends up being three, four, five in the end companies that sell propane in Vermont and we are a competitive industry. So the fewer companies you have, you know, the higher the price could be as that happens. Um, the other thing that I've seen happen across the U.S. when um, prices go up is that people turn to a backup source of energy that's less expensive, and that is usually wood, right? I know we have a lot of wood that's burned. I'm speaking to you at my camp that I have in Maine, and I have, you know, it's a 1940 house, and I have a, a fireplace that we can use if, if we need to. Um, and burning wood in a fireplace in a 1940 house is not the cleanest thing that we can do for the environment. So when you end up driving up prices on clean fuels like propane, people switch to wood. And I think this is ironic because around the world, we are moving people from wood to prevent deforestation and to improve indoor air quality to propane. Um, there's many countries where we have um, people that do not have electricity, do not have access to um, any, anything that's not a solid fuel. And when we move them to a liquid fuel, we end up changing people's lives, reducing massive amounts of carbon. Um, and we're doing that around the world and many governments are looking to, to use more propane to reduce their emissions. Yet here we're looking at penalizing this, um, this product, which is so critical for you as a backup in, in um, energy. And let me just be clear, my industry cannot survive delivering only to generators. You know, we have to have a healthy residential market to be able to survive economically in the state. We can't just sit around and wait for the three days um, you know, every couple of months in the winter that everybody needs immediately needs propane in their generators. That's not a sustainable business model. So if you want to have a reliable backup for the health and safety of your citizens, you're going to need to partner with propane to get there. Uh, we would like to be included in the technical advisory group that Matt mentioned. You know, I think that the lack of having any industry member from the propane industry included in the climate action plan is one of the reasons we're in this pickle because they were thinking the wholesalers would take care of this, uh, but instead it's just going to fall on the local small local businesses that we have. Uh, the wholesalers themselves also are concerned about um, what could happen and unintended, unintended consequences. Those that are delivering directly into the state of Vermont uh, might decide to move out of state, um, which is gonna increase transportation on your roads in Vermont as people have to go further to get their supply of product. It's also gonna reduce your energy security that you have now. 
when the power's out, you need that propane available right where it is. And sometimes there's too, it's out because there's a storm and we can't get rail in immediately uh, to resupply that because there's snow and, and ice all over the rail lines. Um, and it's important that you have a critical infrastructure in Vermont so that you can respond in those times of great need. And we all know that those times of need are likely to increase as we see more impacts from the global warming that's happening out there. Um, so I really stress that you do have the callback position in here. Another issue that I don't think anybody thought about, um, and again, probably because we weren't included, but the way that we sell propane um, to low-income people in Vermont is normally a lot of them will pre-buy or they'll get into a fixed price contract. So right now we're starting these contracts for next winter. If you want to, you know, a lot of the people aren't pre-buying right now with the, the um, war happening, but propane itself is not um, as price fluctuating as the other products. It went up 13% when the war started. Now it's back where it was before. Uh, so we have more stable pricing. However, what do we do with these credits? We have no idea how much they're gonna cost per gallon. So how do we fit? a fixed price contract today to sell to someone a year from now if we don't know what the credit cost is going to be. Well, you know, what's gonna happen is people are just gonna put in a high number and that's, that's not gonna benefit our customers. It's gonna end up increasing pricing. I know that some people think, well, let's just price, you know, propane out of the market because it's a byproduct of fossil fuels and those are evil and we don't like them. However, <laughs> If you do that, you're, you're not helping um, to encourage innovation where the renewable propane of the future is going to be comparable to electricity in Vermont. And it's also at some point, if we can get enough dimethyl ether to include in the renewable propane, it will have a negative carbon intensity. In California, they're considering the carbon intensity of DME and renewable propane to be negative 246. Your electric grid in Vermont is 40 right now in comparable um, terms. So we could actually get to a point where we're cleaner if we encourage innovation. And I think that in the renewable field, we really don't want to stifle innovation. We want to encourage it uh, as much as we can as we move forward. Um, so my main points are that there's a lot of confusion as to how this will be implemented because it does not be applied at the wholesale level. Um, and also I think we need to have that callback information in there and consider propane as part of your solution. We are a way to get to zero. We may not be as clean as hydroelectric power, which is classified as having zero carbon emissions, but we are the cleanest combustion fuel available. And you need to think about how you're gonna do a backup for that. We don't want, as we strive towards environmental justice and making sure that everybody has an equal right to clean energy in Vermont, we should not be looking at relying on battery storage where they're obtaining the heavy metals from the batteries from cobalt and lithium and nickel and cadmium. We don't want to be causing greater environmental damage around the world, which is what's happening now with the cobalt in the Republic of the Congo. So let's think about where we're gonna source our materials, what's gonna be the backup for solar and for wind, for hydro and electricity. Let's look to an energy source that's not gonna cause further degradation and environmental justice impacts in the worst places on earth, just so that we can feel good about what we're doing here in our state. And I'd be glad to answer any questions that you have. Um, any, any questions for Ms. Anderson? Uh, Senator McCormick. Thank you. You refer to propane as the cleanest uh, burnable fuel. Is that because just the chemistry of propane or because of the technology <clears throat> of the, the, the propane burners are more efficient than other kinds of? 
Um, propane, propane equipment is extremely efficient. We usually don't have rebates or upgrades for efficiency because you're already so efficient from what's been installed in your house. Um, you know, the stuff that people have today, the old things are 95% efficient and the new things that are out there are 99% efficient for propane. But the reason it's the cleanest is because it doesn't contain methane. Um, the next item over, you know, from, from propane, when you look at another combustion fuel, it's natural gas. And natural gas contains methane, which is 24 times more potent as a, as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is. Is there an ongoing effort to make the, uh, the burners yet more efficient? Um, yes, all of our burners are right now, like I said, 99% efficient, 98% efficient, I think, for, for um, some of the equipment. But it's, it's already all Energy Star equipment certified um, that's out there. And the emission studies that we've been doing um, also show from the engine technology that's used in transportation that we have the lowest NOx emission of any combustion fuel that um, that exists out there. You know, we're cleaner, propane itself without even renewable propane is cleaner than electricity in 38 states in the United States. Um, and the new NOx engines that they're using in school buses uh, have already meet the California advanced emission standards that are out there. So they've, they've gone way beyond the EPA national standards and they're meeting um, standards that are not gonna come in place for years in the future. So it's extremely clean. And the industry has uh, put a lot of money into trying to develop additional technologies to make it even cleaner. And, and that's something that I'm very involved in now with the renewable propane movement. Thank you. Senator Campion. <clears throat> thank you, and thank you, uh, <clears throat> Ms. Anderson. I believe you said propane is not toxic. Is that accurate? Is that what you said? And could you just define toxic for me? That, 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 that confused me a little bit. Sure, I mean, toxic is something that can, has been shown to cause cancer that's out there. So a toxic chemical, there have been studies done that it can cause cancer um, when it's done. Propane itself is made up of carbon and hydrogen. Those two elements have no toxicity to them at all. Uh, when you burn propane, it produces carbon dioxide, uh, water, and it produces a little bit of nitrogen oxides, like everything does when you burn it because there's nitrogen in the air. Uh, but it's very clean. It's used for cooking. Um, it's used in indoor air. Um, it, that's why we're changing around the world. People from burning solid fuels like wood uh, and charcoal, why we're moving them to propane and working with countries around the world to do that. You know, India's got a program where in three years they reduce their carbon emissions more than the state of Vermont produces in a year. Uh, just from moving people from solid fuels to propane for indoor cooking. It's used in shelters for baby formula warming up when people have warming shelters or when people um, need to evacuate from floods or hurricanes or anything like that. Uh, it's used by the military all over um, to set up mobile kitchens when things happen. I mean, it is the energy that people use when there's a hurricane or a flood or an event to boil their water so that it's clean and they can, can, can um, have clean drinking water and then also be able to cook. It's really fundamental as a uh, backup fuel. It's blessed by chemistry. You can put a whole bunch of it in a little tiny vessel. And so it's portable. Uh, and it's, it's what we use during the pandemic when you had testing centers you needed to heat up. My members went out and some of them donated the propane so that people could go through and get tested uh, for COVID or some of the vaccination points. Um, you know, we were what, immediately how do you get power to this area you call your local propane company and we bring you a tank and you're set up that day and you've got heat so that you can function it's really a necessary part i think of the vermont energy security for your citizens 
Thank you. Yeah, I was just the, the comment about it not being toxic. I needed some some clarification on. Uh, thank you for that. I have a fuel question. So you were talking about natural gas containing methane, and I, I don't know the com combustion technology enough. So is that methane? If methane escapes into the atmosphere, then it's problematic because it is a more potent greenhouse gas, but I was under the impression that the methane in natural gas was combusted when that unit ran so that you weren't emitting methane. Is that correct or incorrect? That No, that is correct. When it's combusted, natural gas is actually cleaner than propane. But when you look at the life cycle, because natural gas is delivered by a pipeline and there are numerous leaks associated with methane during the transportation process of uh, natural gas, when you look at the whole life cycle from when it's produced to being delivered to being used, propane is cleaner than natural gas because we don't have anything escape by a pipeline and we don't have, um, <clears throat> have those massive interstate pipelines to delivering it either. So you have to look at the life cycle analysis and you have that in, in the clean heat standard. Um, and I would just encourage you for all sources of energy, we have to look at the life cycle analysis of it. Um, I've testified in states where they have said, you know, we're, we're only going to look at the emissions that happen at your house. Well, the heat pumps, you know, are, not, are maybe zero emission at your house, but uh, if you're in a state that provides all of its electricity from natural gas, like several of mine do, you have to look at the upstream emissions, right? So on the upstream emissions and the life cycle analysis, propane wins hands down. If you're just looking at your burner tip, the natural gas is cleaner burning by a small fraction than propane is. But because we deliver in closed containers, we don't have the leakage that you would have from a pipeline system. Um, and can you explain that what how a fuel can be combusted and be carbon negative? I wasn't sure what's going on when a fuel ends up becoming carbon negative. How that so the car yeah, the carbon out. negative comes from um, when you introduce, one of the things you can do is introduce into propane dimethyl ether. It makes, we all commonly refer to as DME. And in California, um, the California Air Resources Board has put together a project where they're using um, DME that is produced through anaerobic digestion from dairy farms. Uh, and the DME that's captured uh, has a negative number to it for the carbon intensity that's, and this is all through the California um, Air Resources Board and the state of California for their calculations, which I think we all know are the, the most conservative and stringent that are out there. So you end up adding up to 20% of this negative carbon intensity DME to renewable propane, which is already very low um, because it's made from um, camelina plants, it's made from um, uh, used cooking oil, from uh, biofuels that are produced. Um, it's a beneficial byproduct of these new fuels that are produced, just like it's a beneficial byproduct today of natural gas um, production that's out there. So, so we instead off of these things, then you get that lower number of carbon intensity like you would for a biofuel, and you can combine into that the dimethyl ether, which makes it actually negative for the carbon intensity. When they look at the dimethyl ether that's coming from a digester, are they doing a life cycle analysis of that? So you have the digester because you grew crops that required fuel to grow the crops, to harvest them, to feed them to the cows. The cows are actually great methane emitters. Um, so I'm just wondering if it's an all-in calculation or it's just treating the DME as uh, sort of a, a spin-off with no carbon footprint of its own. Um. I don't believe that's the case. I can double check on that. I'm not 100% positive, but in California, they've always looked at the life cycle analysis completely. So I can't imagine that it wouldn't include um, those upstream emissions that are there. 
you know, the idea is that you're taking a waste product that already exists, right? And then you're using it, it's like composting, you know, you're using it and then the heat that gets put off through the composting inside the anaerobic digester is then used to produce um, this uh, dimethyl ether gas, which they capture, and then it can be added to other products to reduce its carbon intensity. So in, in all, you're overall reducing carbon emissions for the whole process. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your testimony. If you find out anything more about the DME and propane combination, um, if you could send it on, that would be helpful. Um, I will do that. I'll do that. Okay. And I, have, I also sent written testimony in, and I will um, send you a brochure on the renewable propane and, and also gather that DME information for you. Thanks again. Um, with that committee, we'll take a breakthrough till 10.